I'm Kelly Harrell, author, animist, and creator of the Weekly Rune. Solenton Arts is my soul-tending practice, and you're listening to What in the Weird, my podcast in which I talk about runes, actionable animism, soul-tending, and how all of those intersect through sacred activism on my path. The Weekly Rune is out, and if you're not sure what it is, it's a rune cast that I've done for years, focused on the runic calendar and the current half-month rune. The Weekly Rune is now available in full on Patreon.com. Just do a search for Kelly Harrell to find it, and you can find the archive of all past rune casts on my site, soulintentarts.com. If you're not sure what a half-month is or what the runic calendar is, Listen to the early episodes of What in the Weird, or just go read the weekly rune. It's explained fully at the beginning of every runecast. Thank you to everyone who listens to the podcast, to those who send notes and share their experiences of the runes. That's what it's all about, and I'm grateful for the engagement. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters who make the sharing of my rune work through the podcast and the RuneCast possible with their financial support. If you've benefited from the RuneCast, the podcast, or the ton of free articles on the runes, animism, and soul tending on my website, you can show your support through buying my books, which you can find at soulintentarts.com or Amazon, by making a one-time contribution through PayPal or Square, or by contributing regularly through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Kelly Harrell. You can also subscribe to the paid version of the Weekly Rune there, and thank you for it. We've spent the last couple of weeks with Inguas differently than we usually approach this rune in season, which is kind of ironic, really, because in Runic Book of Days, I talk about how the challenge of Inguas is to be present in the new way. And boy, is this a new one. I've talked a lot in the Weekly Rune and this podcast about the Ingwa's initiation, how by this point we've released a sacred seed upon the world to find its own way, and we're somewhat dealing with the empty nest aspects of that, along with feeling the intensity of summer solstice coming and the close of a cycle with the Elder Futhark. Those things are pretty intense on their own. And while we might all feel them under the surface, dealing with the surface has been really hard for the last couple of months. Processing all of that during a pandemic has just been insane. It's a lot to have in our laps at once. And that has most definitely been reflected through the interesting ways that the runes have been coming up weekly in the cast. Modern folks have never faced this kind of worldwide crisis before. So in our relationship with the runes, we've not had reason to address them that way or tap into their wisdom and experience with such phenomena. When we sit with what's at hand regarding what we're dealing with in our personal and collective lives right now and how we can best be in relationship with the runes under these circumstances, the thing that smacks over and over to me at least, is attention to our rituals. If you don't have a good relationship to rituals that function to keep you safely in your lane, which means boundaries and needs, on a good day, it's easy not to understand why one foot in front of the other doesn't seem to be leading you anywhere without good rituals. And in a time like now, it becomes easier to see the areas of life where without the structure of ritual, you can derail completely. At least the version of ritual that Professor Internet puts forward as the gold standard is kind of like, you know, step one, face west. Step two, light a periwinkle candle with your left hand. Step three, begin pouring the salt circle kind of recipes, these formulaic bullet lists. And I'm not knocking those. I know that they serve a purpose for some people. However, if you just read some ritual in a book, 
and you don't have a, a personal relationship with those ingredients to the energy behind the ritual, you don't have an ancestral connection to it, what does that ritual really mean to you? How are you in direct relationship with it? You could be. It's possible. What most of the New Age and pagan community consider ritual are what the old school called high ritual. Sabbath ceremonies, enormously elaborate asks of spirit allies, blessings, dedications, days-long structured productions. These, these are approaches to ritual that are very formulaic and regimented, and they're really challenging for me personally. Though I've worked with some folks who have totemic relationship to certain rituals, and I absolutely understand and respect their place. And in a way, the big rituals are the easiest ones to do. Definitely the sexiest. They get the most attention. But there are others that we have better access to. Under the most normal of circumstances, I struggle with ritual. This is not a big secret. I talk about it a lot and, and what my struggles with it are in my Spirited Paths group. And a lot of people struggle with ritual because our collective framework for it is just boring ass church delegated routines. Like, you know, stand, sit, sing, say these words, repeat them back. Um, or they're like a, a synthetic seasonal monolith that's just because our grandma said we should. And we don't even really know why and we don't feel these kinds of rituals. And when you think of rituals in those contexts, they don't sound like a lot of fun. So what is ritual? When I say ritual, I mean sacred space created to some end, which means embodiment of yourself such that you engage aspects of your cosmology to some intentional, beneficial end. I'm talking about a regularly engaged set of spiritual customs that enrich your life in some way. Define regular how you need to, not the point, but it could be high ritual. It could be something that you do once a year. It could be small daily devotionals. It can be a practice. When I say the word practice, well, I realize the definition of that has also been perverted in, in much the way that we talk about ritual. We kind of, in modern culture, we think it of, of, of practice as something that we do over and over with the intention of eventually getting better at it because of the repetition. And there's an implied joke in professions that are considered practices like law practice, medical practice, that you're stuck in a loop of never improving your skills. I didn't say it was a funny joke. I just said it was a joke. But I hear that all the time when people start talking about rituals and then they start breaking it down into what their practices of rituals are. And that doesn't mean that doing something over and over to gain better skills is a bad idea in spiritual terms. I mean, ultimately, we engage rituals partly to strengthen our direct relationships to the ritual to the mechanism behind the ritual, the tools that are part of it, the cosmology drawn on to enliven it to its outcome. All of that is animism. It's all about relationships. And that doesn't happen with a drive-by. So sure, I mean, practice your rituals. Do them over and over. Do them regularly to deepen those relationships. And yet it's in those smaller practices that we tend to fall off the path. We fall out with those daily little practices like tending altars, singing to the Lanvatir. And it's those daily ones that teach us to be ready and better at the bigger rituals. The small, regular rituals teach us how to hold that kind of sacred space safely and ethically and for them to have the result that's needed for all involved, we kind of have to be good at it. We got to practice it. And those small practices build the relationships for the high rituals. What I usually see people doing or associating in their minds when I first bring up ritual is focus on the big ones. It's, it's almost always 
where people's minds and their questions go when we have this conversation. And I see them immediately sag under fatigue at the mere suggestion of ritual. And it's because we culturally haven't been prepared for that. And when we think of ritual culturally, we think of boring. But at the end of it, you know, you, when you take those cultural things into consideration, it really comes down to we haven't been prepared for ritual. We haven't cultivated relationships to our cosmologies and our tools and our spirit allies. We haven't cultivated a relationship to the smaller everyday rituals. And, and even when I start to open the discussion about breaking it down to smaller rituals, I still get this massive detachment from people because they're afraid to start it. They, the, the, the prospect of adding one more thing to their day, and I get it. And they're afraid that, well, oh, I'm excited about it. This speaks to me. I understand what you're saying, but what if I can't follow through? What if I do it for three days and then I fall off? Or they're afraid that they won't do it right. They get analysis paralysis and never start because they can't find the right color cloak. So sacred ritual falls into the same bucket of unfinished things that clutter does, the car not washed, the grass not mowed. And it, it, it's easy for that to happen. I've been there, done that. And, and one of the key reasons that it gets relegated to those unfinished perfectionist areas of life is because we treat it like a binary, ritual on, ritual off. And the big thing that comes out of that whole perspective is, again, yes, you guessed it, it's shame. And when we feel shame, we don't do what triggers that feeling. It's very logical, right? That doesn't feel good. I'm not doing it. So the behavior and undertaking of ritual creates a sense of shame that causes anxiety, which leaves me feeling vulnerable. None of this adds up to safe and supportive sacred space. So the, the end of the day, people just decide, well, I'm not going to do it. And if that's the one thing of my spiritual practice that ends up falling off, I'm still doing these other five things on a regular basis. So ritual doesn't matter. And, and really, that sequence of events is a very functional warning system and response. If I feel ashamed when I do this, it's going to create anxiety. That leaves me feeling unsafe. I'm not going to do ritual. The problem with that whole picture, that whole equation, is we need ritual. We especially need ritual in times like this because those smaller gestures of daily practice are what keep us going. They distract us in a really functional way. They impart skill and relationship. They meet the need for which they're crafted. They're what prepare us for times like now. Ritual work is the chop wood, carry water part of an animistic path. It's not sexy. It's often not even inspiring or compelling. But that's mostly because ritual isn't something we do only for ourselves. Again, when we do culturally discuss ritual, it's usually in the sense of what can I get? What can I ask for? That, that's how we kind of approach prayer. There has to be a point of the communal self showing up in the creation of ritual. We perform rituals to keep our spirit relationships strong and healthy, to keep our boundaries functional for ourselves and our allies and our communities. And we do them to fulfill the needs of ourselves, our allies, and our communities. It can't be ritual on, ritual off. Animism doesn't work that way. If it can't and still be animism. Animism is an experience. It is embodiment at intimate levels. Every moment that you can bring yourself back to the awareness to do so, so that everything through your routine is sacred. The minute you open your eyes till you close them again at bedtime. And probably somewhere in between all of that. When we realize that everything is sacred, we have the opportunity to make everything a sacred ritual. Sure, sometimes it's about the need 
that needs to be met, the boundary that needs to be reinforced or adjusted. It's also about flexing our awareness into direct relationship. It's about pointing our antenna to the sacred, not so much about an outcome or the tools or how we pull it together. I heavily emphasize in my coursework in the spirited path that we not begin with the big rituals and to ignore Professor Internet. Find the sacred rituals you're already doing, you just don't regard them as sacred. Because ultimately, that's the problem. It's not ranking rituals or practices or judging them as good or bad. It's whether you can allow yourself to view a practice as sacred. I've talked about this a lot of times in my blog, but it's really, really difficult to begin a new supportive habit or practice during distress, spiritual or not. It's hard because fear alters you. Your brain is not functioning as it normally would. Animistically speaking, everything is altered right now. The systems you engage daily are altered. They're not functioning as they normally would. Because we're all connected, everything on the planet and maybe beyond is experiencing a collective alteration. Yet our nature demands that we find a sense of rhythm no matter what's going on. We're creatures of habit, and not just because we like to be comfy, but because our survival demands it. Our survival, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, demands that we find a rhythm, and that means we must craft new ritual. How do you create a new ritual under duress? Rituals must have meaning for you. And that is ultimately the failure of step one, step two. It isn't that they're elementary. It isn't that they're lacking passion. It's that if you don't feel them, you won't do them. And if you don't do them, they can't support you. Meaning is power. It's motivation. And I don't mean motivated in a sentimental greeting card kind of way or even in a martyred spiritual kind of way. I mean, we aren't motivated where we can't find meaning, and where we don't find meaning, we aren't motivated. That's that's part of how the human experience works. Those two things are in relationship. Don't break yourself trying to figure out a ritual that has meaning for you right now. Go to something that you already do every day, something that you have to do every day. Even if it has a chop wood, carry water feel to it, maybe especially those. My communities snicker when I bring up brushing your teeth to illustrate this point. And then they go do it and their minds are blown. But when you've thought about brushing your teeth, do you think of it as a sacred act? When have you talked to the toothpaste or to the brush? Because they're your tools. When do you talk to the water? Because that's an element in your cosmology. When's the last time you talked to your teeth? They're allies. People laugh when I assign that as homework. But the truth is, if you try to start with a summer solstice ritual as the one that's going to get you in the game, you're probably in for a rude awakening. So when we experience daily life in the pandemic haven't been developing the the sacred relationships that we need through small rituals, through everyday regular engagement, the stress and change in how we support ourselves now takes an even deeper toll. Like it's hard to begin with, trying to do the big stuff now, not the best move. Even for some folks who do have a good relationship to ritual, are finding that those rituals don't serve them right now. And they may not serve them again. Who knows? But that resistance to update brings its own shame and anxiety. I can't tell you how many people I've known who have had intuitive and spiritual practices for 20 and 30 years whose stuff is suddenly not working for them. And they're panicking. They're freaking out. And, you know, justifiably so. But we can choose to feel the stress of our rituals telling us they don't suit our way of embodying anymore and be annoyed with that, or we can allow the tension of evolving with them. Which one do you think is more functional? Go back to the basics. 
rethink what ritual is to you and where it naturally shows up in your life. It can be the high Sabbath stuff. I'm not saying that it can't, but it's likely to be the everyday stuff right now because once ritual ceases to be a dramatized break for sacred engagement and it finally becomes the routine of the day done sacredly, you're there. As an animist, it's all sacred. And realizing you can work that awareness into rituals you're already doing is powerful direct relationship. We're not brought up in a culture that values or teaches meaning, rit- meaningful ritual. And for the sake of personal or collective enrichment, that's really not an accident. It's just one more thing on a long list of colonized stuff. And, and apart from all the spiritual benefits we've talked about, ritual gives you better memory. It reduces your intersocial insecurities. It builds confidence. It improves nonlinear problem solving. It reduces anxiety. And no, I'm not a scientist who tested these improvements in a lab. Because don't you know those improvements already when you engage in sacred ritual? Because haven't you really been doing this all along? Now do it with sacred intention. Go brush your teeth. Thanks for listening. If you have questions or insights about working with the runes in season, or you just want somebody to bounce your ideas off, feel free to email me at kelly, that's K-E-L-L-E-Y, at solintenarts.com, or you can call into the Anchor app, which you can download for Android or iPhone. Also check out earlier episodes by downloading them from Google Play or iTunes and various other podcast platforms. And you can learn more about me, Runic Book of Days, and my work by visiting solintonarts.com or on Instagram at Kelly Soul Arts. I'm Kelly, and this has been What in the Weird. Mm-hmm.